the circulation team takes it from there. And the turnaround time where we have to get this done is relatively slow. It's a few hours usually. It depends on the distributor. So this isn't a really pressing real-time kind of problem, but it does have to be robust because in the end, we do end up controlling a lot of, a lot of stores and a lot of sales. Now, this is a problem that has existed at the time in any newspaper and probably many other types of companies for a really long time. So we're not starting from scratch here. We're replacing an existing algorithm. But the existing algorithm is very heuristics based. Uh, it's very manually tuned. So roughly what it has been doing is taking for a type of store, for a store, the highest sales from recent weeks in that store, then multiplying it by a number A, which is probably a little bit more than one, and then adding a number B, which might be a copy or a few copies. And then that's the number of newspapers that you want to send next week. And the trouble, from our perspective, is that A and B are really hand-tuned. And they're hand-tuned by a type of store, maybe by the location, by any number of things based on uh, the historical experience of the people involved in this project. And also, the code for this is interspersed among like, many, many lines of COBOL. And that COBOL code doesn't just do this, it does many other things, and it's not at all modular. So it's really hard to keep track of, uh, of what exactly is going on. So normally in talks these days, we don't get to show COBOL code. <laughs> and so I showed some COBOL code. Um, and this is just like part of it. Um, but this is what we were trying to sift through to see if we could use what they were doing um, as a starting point for kind of learnings of the types of things we should look at. And in the end, we kind of gave up. Um, part of the reason that the print group wanted us involved in this project was because this code is very difficult to modify, very difficult to comprehend, um, and to add extra information into that would be helpful in modeling but isn't currently there. Uh, it's also a very classical data science problem of time series modeling. And so this was a really good project for us to get involved in as um, part of integrating data science into the New York Times. So in terms of algorithms for this, um, the problem is separable really into two parts. The first question is regarding <coughs> predictions of demand. Given previous sales in certain stores, in certain days, how many papers do we think will sell in a given, you know, next Thursday or something? But then, once we know that, there's the second part, which is if we think four papers will sell next Thursday, how many should we really deliver? And if we think that we're really sure that four papers are going to sell, then we'll send four papers. But there's always some sort of uncertainty associated with our demand prediction. And since we make a profit on the papers, uh, it usually pays for us to send some extras uh, in case the noise fluctuates up and we get an extra sale that makes it worth it to err on the side of extra delivery. So the policy function determines exactly how many we should send based on our predictions. So the first type of algorithm that we used for this problem was just a classic autoregressive lag one uh, algorithm, which is a very common type of time series model. Um, this is for the prediction half of the problem to say how many papers do we think will sell given historical sales. And so here um, you have x at time t would be the uh, demand for a newspaper at time t. Uh, you can parameterize it by a constant c plus phi times uh, the most recent sale, you know, the sales at times t minus 1, which in our case would be like a week ago, and uh, then plus some noise epsilon. So basically, today's sale is a linear function of last week's. Uh, we tend to make one model per store per, per day of the week. This is because the days of the week kind of behave differently and on a store basis, uh, it changes. For example, the Sunday paper is really large and really expensive compared to the weekdays, and so that's a significant difference um, in both sales behavior and in cost and profit behavior. Um, also, some of the stores are only open on weekdays or weekends, et cetera, or they have different traffic patterns during weekdays. Uh, we use about a year's worth of data to fit for the parameters, uh, C and phi, and then um, <coughs> hyperparameters for the model, like the training window of around a year or what lag to use for the autoregressive model were chosen via cross-validation when we were developing this model in the first place. 
Um, I meant to say that this was uh, really developed by Dale Kim. It was no longer at the Times, but I want to call out the people who actually built this stuff, since there have been a number of us who have worked on this project. Um, for the policy function for this, you know, given the demand that the AR model predicts, uh, how many should we actually send? We're just using the ceiling <coughs> of the demand so that we know we're always sending at least as many newspapers as we think will sell. There's also this factor that we call the bump, which is that if there have been recent sellouts in the data, just send an extra on top of what we would otherwise send. And this is a kind of manual uh, brute force attempt at addressing the fact that our data are actually censored. Because if there are sellouts, then we don't know what the demand actually was. All we know is that the demand was at least how many as we delivered. So by just gradually bumping up the number we're delivering in case of sellouts, we're slowly uh, reducing that censoring in the data set. In terms of implementation, this was all written in Python. Uh, the AR model is in stats models, and it was all written in a single script. We also had on a local server a Flask app hosting a matplotlib PNGs that monitored the draws and the sales just to make sure that everything was going rather smoothly over time. Uh, the weekly process was run by a cron job on that server. Um, and this, this worked, but it wasn't the greatest like, data engineering setup. Um, we didn't have any separate dev or prod environments. You know, deploying the code involved just like CPAing it from your laptop up to the server. So it ended up being rather fragile. Uh, and we wanted to improve the data engineering as well as the algorithms. But we're still in the algorithm section for now. Um, the second, and this is actually the main algorithm that we're still using, uh, is uh, Poisson regression. And this was developed by Dory <coughs> Goldman. Um, and in many ways, it's similar to the AR model in that uh, today's sale is a linear function of previous sales per store per day of the week. Uh, we also added a dependence on sales not just last week, but also 52 weeks ago in case there is some seasonality to be able to capture a little bit of that in the model as well. Um, again, we use about a little more than a year's worth of data to fit the model parameters. But there are two main improvements between <coughs> this model compared to the AR model. And the first one is that we're assuming that the sales are drawn from a Poisson distribution rather than a Gaussian one. And so this plot shows the difference in that they're both distributions, the blue is Poisson and the green is Gaussian, and they both have expected value of one. So this is what you expect for expecting <coughs> to sell one newspaper. Uh, the probability distribution you can see for actually ending up selling three or four newspapers is way higher in the case of the Poisson distribution than in the normal distribution. And so this means that if you have some noisy data, um, this makes a really significant difference in the results of your fit um, in terms of understanding the expected value of your sales. The other improvement here compared to the AR is that uh, we are now considering sellouts as part of the likelihood function in the minimization. <coughs> so I wanted to go into that in a little more detail. Um, the equation on the top is just the definition of the uh, Poisson probability distribution. Here, lambda is the Poisson parameter, um, which tells you the expected sales. And z is the demand that actually happens in the store for newspapers. So z is the Poisson distributed latent variable uh, described by the Poisson parameter expected sales lambda. Now lambda is what we're trying to figure out here. It's the expected sales that, or the expected demand that we're trying to fit for. And so we want to parameterize this in terms of our features. And so that's what we're doing here where um, you have lambda parameterized in terms of weights theta and features x. And the feature is x, since we're doing a time series, it's just uh, previous sales, like last week, last year, whatever. And the theta are the parameters that we're fitting for in the minimization. Now, we need to understand what the probability distribution of our data is. Um, and so that is the probability of the papers that we see bought, um, given 
the papers that we deliver, and then this lambda expected demand. Um, so what the first line is doing really on the right-hand side is just putting in Z the uh, observed demand and marginalizing over it, so that's kind of trivial. Um, but then you can separate this into two terms, where it equals the sum over the, the uh, observed true demand, Z, uh, of the probability of papers bought, B, given that demand, Z, and the number we delivered, D, times the probability of the demand given lambda. And the reason to do this is because that second part, the probability of the demand versus lambda, is just the uh, Poisson distribution that was defined on the previous slide. So we know what that is by our assumption that uh, this is a Poisson distributed variable. <coughs> so then we just need to look at what the first term is. And this is where the sellouts come in. You have um, on the third line that the uh, probability of the papers bought, the number of papers bought given the demand and the papers we send, um, is in the case where the demand is less than what we send, we know that the number of papers bought is just uh, equal to the demand. However, if the demand is larger than what we sent, all we know is that the number of papers bought is equal to the number that we sent. So we don't really know what the demand is. So if we plug in these two delta functions uh, into the term above, you get the line at the bottom, where now that sum is just separated into two terms, where you're considering the, the probability one piece in cases where you're delivering enough, and so you can see what the demand is, and then the second term regarding sellouts. So this is the uh, probability then that we put into the maximum likelihood estimation um, to do the fit for lambda and therefore actually fit what the parameters theta are. So that is how we do the predictions half of the Poisson regression. And then <coughs> given that information and the fitted thetas, we can get our predicted demand in a store for whatever given day. Uh, the next piece is what to do in terms of how many newspapers to actually send, the policy function. And it turns out that this is actually a well-known problem in optimization circles, and it's called the news vendor algorithm. And uh, basically what you're doing is just optimizing for profit, and this is an analytical solution, so we don't need to do any kind of machine learning in this part at all. Uh, if you want to optimize for profit, we define profit simply just as um, the price of the newspaper times how many are sold, uh, minus the cost for us to get the newspaper out there times how many we send. Um, and I realized that I never actually told you that the jargony term for how many papers you deliver is called draw. Uh, so I might have been saying draw here and there, but that is what I'm referring to. Um, so if you want to maximize the profit, if you just take this, take the derivative of it, <coughs> set it to zero, uh, it implies that the probability that the actual demand is less than or equal to what you send is just equal to the price of the paper minus our costs over the price of the paper. This means that the optimal draw that we want to send uh, is the smallest integer such that that probability is greater than or equal to the price minus cost of our price. And so we know pretty much everything in this, in this equation. The probability is Poisson distributed, um, so that's fine. Uh, we know the price and the cost structure of our own business. And Z is the demand prediction from the previous step. So we can just sweep through possible values of how many newspapers we want to deliver, D, and find the one that satisfies this constraint, and then that is the optimal number that we want to send. So that's what we do. So once we had written this fancier algorithm, we wanted uh, to also upgrade our code a bit to make it easier to develop more algorithms in the future. And so we made this more object-oriented, we made a model class uh, that could be inherited that basically took the form of scikit-learn classes with uh, query, fit, and predict, but also with the policy function. Um, and we also extracted some common library code that we expected all of the different models would probably want to use. So now that we had a couple different algorithms and we also wanted to compare not just between them, but between us and uh, the previous, the original algorithm, which we tend to call BAU, business as usual, we wanted to run some experiments. 
So the first thing that we needed to do in running these experiments is figure out treatment and control groups of stores. So this is a cool project because you can actually deploy different algorithms, predictions in actually different physical stores and see what happens. Cross your fingers and hope that you don't tank the New York Times. Um, the matching group, the matching technique that we used between the treatment and control stores is very straightforward. All we wanted to do was make sure that we were matching pairwise stores with similar sales history. Um, however, we also ended up realizing that we needed to do a number of sort of <coughs> trial and error checks uh, to make sure that the uh, basically the domain knowledge associated with the problem <coughs> was uh, sufficiently applied to this matching. For example, um, not all the stores sell <coughs> papers on the weekends. So we need to make sure that we weren't pairing a, a seven-day store with a five-day store. Um, or some stores have higher costs than the others because some print sites are more expensive than others, so we had to make sure that our pairings had similar cost structure. You know, things like that. We also needed to build some dashboards to uh, be able to visualize how the experiments were going. And so this is a screenshot from one that we're actually deprecating. We're replacing it with an updated version, but it will show basically the same uh, basic information. Here, the left and right columns show the uh, Monday through Saturday on the left and Sunday on the right. And we tend to look at Sunday differently just because the costs are so different. Um, the size of the newspaper is different. A lot of people only buy the Sunday paper. Um, so we tend to look at it as kind of a different product. The top two plots show profit compared to the uh, BAU algorithm. And Actually, this whole screenshot is for the first algorithm that we tried, the autoregressive model. Um, I erased all the numbers from the y-axis of these plots so that you can't see how much money we make. But the, uh, the profit is bigger than zero, so we did definitely do better than the BAU algorithm. So that was great. The bottom two plots uh, show how many newspapers we sent, the draws, and how many were sold. And the darker colors are a treatment group the lighter colors are the control group, the BAU original algorithm. And so here you can see what the algorithm's doing. And it thinks that we were sending way too many extra papers and it cut down hugely into the numbers that we sent, saving a lot of money in printing costs and distribution costs. This also has a minimal but significant effect on the sales uh, in that on average, we were still meeting demand, but on, in cases where the demand was much higher than expected, there were more sellouts. And so you can see that our algorithm was actually selling less in the control by a bit. Uh, however, that eating into the sales uh, didn't come at such an expensive profit, such that you know, we're still winning significantly on profit. So we looked at these results and we thought they were good. You know, We're making money. Uh, so we went back to the print group uh, our stakeholders in the project, and we're like, check it out, we're making all this money, and they weren't actually very happy about this because this profit was coming at the expense of this loss in sales. And at this point, we really internalized the fact that the sales matter more than just the money <coughs> the sales to the company. The circulation numbers matter, for example, for the advertising department, um, and it's really hard to quantify the value to the other parts of the company of these sales numbers. So this kind of put us in a bit of a bind because we were still wanting to optimize for profit, but, but don't lose too many sales, and, but they won't define how many sales are too many sales, and so what are we supposed to do? But this turns out to be a really good uh, case for constrained optimization. And so what we did That's not an oops. That's a uh, we need to modify the algorithms moment. Um, what we did was modify our use of the news vendor policy function. Because we no longer want to optimize really for profit. What we want to do is maximize profit, but also put some weight on the sales numbers. And so what you do is you introduce this lambda Lagrange multiplier, which is a ne negative number. So you're maximizing profit plus some number times sales. So if you put this into the uh, equations from the, pre the slide a few slides ago with the same kind of math, 
you just uh, okay. maximize that, you find that the optimal draw is the case where the probability of the demand being less than or equal to the draw <coughs> is greater than price minus lambda minus cost over price minus lambda, which is the same functional form as we had before, but just effectively increasing the sales price by a negative lambda. So this makes it worth sending extra papers because it's as if whenever anybody buys a paper, it gives the times a little extra money on top of what the sales price actually is. Um, the obvious question at this point is, what should we put as lambda? Because it's an entirely tunable parameter. And we decided to leave this up to the stakeholders. Um, we made a plot for them that looked something like this. Uh, the y-axis shows how much extra money that our algorithm will make compared to what they're already doing. And the x-axis shows how many sales will make compared to what they're already doing. And so you can see that we can make a lot of money if we are selling significantly less. Um, and then as we bump up the sales more and more, we progressively lose profit. Mm -hmm. Was there any interest in going even in the opposite direction and seeing if by so oversupplying you could increase sales? No, because it seemed that what they were already doing in the market was flooding the market. And it was almost never selling out. So this is actually an interesting question because in the example that I'm showing you, yes. However, this is just for one distributor. And in other markets, that hasn't been true. Uh, we have seen that we need to go deliver more than they've delivered and then make up for some opportunity in sales. So it does go both ways. Um, but this one was the first one that we did, and it's the largest one that we did, so it's still the most common case for us. Um, so we expected them to look at this plot and say, okay, you know, let's do it somewhere around this like inflection point where you're still making pretty much all the money, and, but you're not like wasting sales. But that's not at all what happened. They came back and said, oh, let's do something around here where we're still making profit over what they were doing before, but putting much more attention on the sales than we just offhand expected. And so we realized that this tunable knob is really handy in this project because um, we don't have to, as the data science team, understand all of the business considerations that go into the print circulation group. Uh, we can leave that up to them. And at the same time, it gives them some level of control and insight into our algorithms, which makes them more comfortable working with us uh, so that it's not so much like giving up all control of their business to some kind of black box. So in the end, we ran a lot of experiments, um, some of them AR-based, most of them Poisson-based, but with different values of this lambda parameter. And we could show them just model comparison bar charts where the green here, like each one of these letters is a different algorithm or a different variant of the algorithm. The green is how much money we're making versus their BAU algorithm. The red is how many sales we're selling compared to the BAU algorithm. So you can see it varies from like losing a bunch to being even. And uh, so we showed this to them and they said, we said, which one should we put in production? And they chose F, I believe. Okay, so finally, I wanted to uh, go over the app architecture a little bit. A couple of years ago, the uh, New York Times made a significant effort to move over to the Google Cloud platform, which has been wonderful. Uh, and as part of this process, we decided to re-platform this onto Google Cloud as well, and uh, using mainly App Engine and App Engine Flex. So there are a few different components to this. One of them is the web UI, um, which is run on App Engine standard. The reporting and predictions uh, calculations are all run on App Engine Flex because, at least at the time, uh, you couldn't run stuff like Pandas and SciPy on App Engine standard. So you needed something more uh, where you could have your own custom containers on it. We keep all of our data in various places, mostly BigQuery, but also Cloud Storage, Cloud SQL, also a little bit of data store uh, for hosting the sales data and also config information. And 
This is all deployed via drone. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward for the App Engine standard to uh, hook it up from like GitHub commits and tags to uh, an App Engine deploy. Uh, the, for App Engine Flex, it's a little more involved because you need to build your own container and then deploy that to App Engine Flex. The weekly process is very similar to what I showed before, but just for comparison's sake. Um, again, there's a weekly cron job per con uh, distributor that's hosted on the App Engine Standard instance, but it takes advantage of task queue uh, tasks, which is very handy because it involves like retrying of of tasks and things like this. Basically, what uh, the cron job kicks off is a process to look for data on the FTP server because we don't want to, we don't know exactly when it's going to show up. Uh, we just know that it tends to show up at a certain time. And we don't want to wait super long to the last possible instant when it might show up to start looking. Uh, so the task looks for the data. If it's not there, it fails. The task queue will take over the job of retrying this process every n minutes or whatever you set it to for as long as you want and until it's been some sort of cut, up, cut off time that you can set, at which point it'll fail permanently and then you can deal with the consequences of the data never showing up in whatever way that you want. Um, logs for the project are sent to Stackdriver and uh, that sends us emails if there are errors in the process. But mainly we keep track of this with Slack uh, because Slack and Python have a very easy integration and so we uh, output a lot of quality checks and progress messages to a Slack channel devoted for th these logs. And I think, I don't know if you can read this or not, it's just a screenshot of um, it telling us that the reporting is done, the, the validation of the data is done with links to the UI so you can see what's going on. The reporting process um, does a lot of calculations of aggregations just to make sure that the experiments are going well and so that we can see how the experiments are going. Um, traditionally, we've been doing this in a lot of pandas in the App Engine Flex instances. However, we've been really moving it to BigQuery because uh, it, it's a lot easier for BigQuery to handle things like parallelization and memory rather than us worrying about like running out of memory on our uh, App uh, Engine Flex instance if there's too much data. Uh, we also run statistical tests on the data quality to make sure that what we're getting in as sales data is somewhat consistent with uh, historical data. And if that's not true, then it raises all sorts of warnings in our Slack channel. Uh, we save all the data back to BigQuery and then also mirror it in Cloud SQL so that we can use that for filtering in real time on the front end UI. Uh, the predictions process is very similar. It reads data from BigQuery, it runs the predictions with uh, a lot of SciPy and some scikit-learn on uh, and then coming up with the predicted number of deliveries for next week, which it saves back to Google Cloud Storage. We also run validation tests on this to make sure that the predictions that we're coming up with are not very different from what we came up with last week. And if they are, it again raises a lot of messages in our Slack channel and then stops the process so we don't submit predictions that look crazy. But assuming that past the validation checks, then the last step is just to copy the data or the predictions up to the FTP site where the circulation team uh, picks it up from there. <coughs> so that's sort of the project from beginning to end. Um, I think it's a really interesting project to work on because it has a lot of different components that you run into in data science projects in general. Uh, for example, we did have to do some custom modeling and fancy math with the algorithms to make sure that what we were solving for was really appropriate to the, uh, the domain knowledge and the, the way the problem was working. Um, this was a cool opportunity to do a bunch of data engineering and replatform everything with uh, up-to-date tools. I like the experiments that we can run in this project because you can really measure how much money you're making and that's very satisfying because often with other projects we, uh, we're looking at like click-through rate or something which is much, I mean it's related to the bottom line but you have to make a lot of assumptions in how it's related to the bottom line. So this was kind of fun as a change. Uh, and then finally, communication was a really big part of this project because you know, as data scientists optimizing our profit, uh, we thought we were doing a very good job and then 
we only really learned from sitting down with our print <coughs> partners and talking with them that like our initial algorithms didn't actually outperform the original BAU algorithm by the standards of everybody involved. And so only after like sussing out with them what was important could we figure out how to like fold not just their quantitative concerns but also their qualitative concerns into our algorithm so that the project was a success for the whole team. That's it, thanks. Okay, um, so for the prediction task, it, it seemed like a really good fit for a, like a Bayesian regression, just because you could tie all the regressions together and get an estimate of uh, confidence in the parameters that you're learning. Yeah. It seems like for what you want to do, that would be really useful, but have you tried that? Or? Um, we have tried a few different things that... Um, I don't believe we've tried a Bayesian regression, but it would give, assuming the fit's accurate, like it would give a much better estimate of the errors than which would help with the second part of the problem. That's definitely true. Um, what we have seen is that in the second part of the po problem, the policy function, where we're assuming that the uncertainty on our parameter on the final prediction is, is Poisson, that that's a fairly accurate uh, assumption given the data that we see. So I'm not sure how much difference it would make in practice. It would, it would change your plus on parameter. Right? It, yeah, it, it would in the minimization part. And it would be interesting to see how then the errors that you get yeah. match with the errors that we are assuming now. Right, it would tie the regressions together so you get better accuracy in general. Yeah, we have tried hierarchical modeling of the stores so that we're not modeling each of them separately. Um, which didn't give us as much lift as we expected. So we've gone a little bit down that route, but it would be interesting to go further. But uh, you said that you have a different model for each distributor. Um, we actually have a different model for each store. 47,000 models. Well, we're not regulating them all. <laughs> but ultimately, when we take over the universe, yes. Um, so does that mean that they're recalculated in an automated way every week? Or? They're refit every week, yeah. I mean, they're, they're pretty small models in that there are only a few features per store. But it adds up, definitely. <laughs> 47,000 small models. But we do have to pay attention to that and make sure we don't develop anything too sophisticated so that we can't turn it around in time. Mm -hmm. Do you predict uh, spikes in that? No. That's actually um, something that that is not a use case for our algorithm. We're doing just day-to-day -day normal operations. If something is happening that's special, then human beings just override us. Because there's just not enough historical data of that appropriate. You know, the, the human knowledge about that is much better than what we would do. Yep, they, they override us then. <coughs> New stores, they don't give to us immediately. They have a policy where for the first, like, I think five weeks, they just send, like, five papers or something. Or I forget what the number is. They, they set a number depending on something. Um, and then only once we have that, like, intro training set, um, then we start regulating them. And that's actually the same policy that they always had. They've, they've always given everything a flat set at the beginning and then reevaluated. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to execution for uh, 47,000 stores, is it something like each model, whatever parameter or whatever number it gives back, that's how it really happens? Or is it something like for the top premium stores, these are the number of newspapers that should be delivered? So when it comes to execution, of course, it would be very tricky to manage that. Yeah, I mean, what we, what we give back is for every store ID for every day of the week, this is the number you want to send. And really, on the low-level execution side, I don't know how it works from there on out. Um, I mean, they, they have an agreement with their distributors to, on the store-by-store -store level, day-of-week-by-day-of-week level, to 
as much as possible follow our instructions. And then you mentioned that uh, one model runs per day by week for each store. Uh, have you ever tried crafting these stores and then applying regression on top of it? It's because each store has different attributes when you talk about location, when you talk about footfalls it has, and time is that it's open. It would vary a lot. So have you ever tried that? Uh, We've tried, but we didn't find any real groupings of the stores that added enough, like that helped enough in reducing the noise compared to the precision you lose in grouping them together. And it gave sort of similar level results. Hmm? We've wanted to, but we have to give the predictions kind of far in advance. Um, so like on a Wednesday, say, like so today, we'll give predictions for next Monday through next Saturday. And the weather forecast like isn't that great at that time out. And then also it doesn't match the training data because our training data would be like hindsight perfect. So you know, it, it's not something that I think is super practical, but it's something we've always wanted to do because we know that it should make a difference. Mm -hmm. Any plans to make it like an API or something as opposed to this FTP push method? No, because the FTP push method is what the print people want. Um, I think API might be a little less useful for them. I mean, we've talked about like them taking it from Google Cloud Storage or you know whatever, but but this works. So because after this handoff, they take it, they like ingest it into their mainframe computer and do like old school mainframe <coughs> things to actually distribute all the rest of it out. Um, so we, we're like inserting ourselves as a piece into their broader system rather than the other way around. Is there, uh, when you calculated the profit, is it sort of the generic profit per paper averaged over all of the 47,000 stores? Or is it somehow specific because obviously some places are further from the printing plant or, you know, people get tickets for delivery or something like that? Yeah, I mean, we have it down to basically the profits are different by print site because yeah. the, the deals that the paper has with the different print sites are different. Um, but the delivery cost, I think, is kind of flat uh, per, per distributor. Uh, so it's like kind of a middling level of granularity. I think everybody is done with questions, so I'll be around. <laughs>